I quit drinking in June of 1993, which meant that by February of 98, it had been almost five years since I'd had a drop of alcohol. I was 28 years old, too young to swear it off for life. My 22-year-old self had exhibited a distinct lack of control regarding alcohol. But I told myself that plenty of people drank too much in college. It didn't mean that I could never drink again. Certainly, giving it up for a few years had been a good idea. I'd broken the habit of daily drinking. I'd learned to handle stress without it. But I'd grown up a lot in the past five years. I was making good progress towards a PhD. I had goals and plans. I was even saving some money on my modest stipend. And I hadn't fucked a stranger since October of 92. I was ready to try drinking again. Someone who was this together wouldn't have a problem. The trouble was, everyone in my life knew and accepted, even supported, the fact that I didn't drink. At the beginning of grad school, there had certainly been some pressure to partake. Some assumptions made that, of course, everyone drank. I stood strong, though, muttering, it didn't work out for me to drink, all the while clutching a pack of clove cigarettes. I wasn't actually a smoker, so I got a really good buzz off of just a few puffs, instantly relaxing me enough to put forth a veneer of coolness and sociability. Drunk people would smell them and gravitate towards me as the chick with the cloves. It was the closest I'd ever come to being edgy and cool, doing some sober partying with a bunch of biomedical grad students. <laughs> My sobriety was greatly aided by attendance at 12-step meetings. As a devout atheist, I had some serious quibbles with the spiritual aspects of the program. But the social aspects were surprisingly rewarding. At that point, my closest friends were all in AA. I had genuine fun with them, aided only by strong coffee and the occasional camel light. Because of these friendships, when I wanted to try drinking again, it felt awkward. And deep down, I still had some doubts about my ability to handle it. So I didn't want to buy booze for myself and drink at home, alone. That's what alcoholics do. Opportunity came in the form of a conference in Miami. It was a small conference, grad students only, and I was the only person from my university attending. Like most academic conferences, I knew that it would be largely an excuse to get some free meals complemented with free booze. The perfect setting for an experiment in responsible drinking. If it didn't work out, I wouldn't have to tell anyone about it. And I wouldn't embarrass myself in front of any important people. If it was successful, I could break the news to my AA sponsor gently. We can still be friends, but I won't be attending those thinly veiled prayer meetings anymore. <laughs> and at the next grad student party, I'd casually sip a beer with everyone else, still puffing on a clove to maintain my street cred. Wine and beer flowed freely at the opening reception and the afternoon meetings. I casually accepted whatever was offered, and it was wonderful. It was like returning to an old lover and finding out that the sex is even better than you remembered, the conversations even wittier. As the familiar warm glow enveloped my body, relaxing yet stimulating at the same time, I couldn't believe that I'd ever thought that clove cigarettes could replace this feeling. And I was handling it. Yeah, I was getting tipsy. The last night of the conference I got drunk, but so did everybody, and nothing bad happened. The day after the conference's closing party, I picked up a rental car at the Miami airport and headed down to the Keys for a few days of scuba diving in Key Largo. After checking into a cheap hotel, I headed out to explore the tropical paradise. And because I could, my first stop was a liquor store. I only got one bottle of beer, thinking I'd have a little pre-dinner drink in my room. I lingered over it, congratulating myself on remembering the importance of pacing. I headed out to dinner at a picturesque place grilling up jerk chicken outdoors with cabana seating. I ordered a plate, and then, of course, three pina coladas was just what the scene required. 
It helped me to socialize with the other vacationing strangers seated around those picturesque cabanas. Two brothers down from North Carolina, fixing to head out on a fishing boat the next morning, regaled me with tales of past fishing trips and good marriages gone bad, all the while winking and intimating that though they were done with women, they just might make an exception for me. They were over-the-top ridiculous, but I enjoyed the attention. It suddenly occurred to me, it would be brilliant fun to drive down to Key West, stopping at every key along the way to have a different rum drink. I'd always wanted to go to Key West, so I did, right that exact minute. I made it as far as Big Pine Key, about 75 miles down. All of a sudden, I realized, shit, it's after midnight, and I'm supposed to be on a dive boat at 8 a.m., I turned around and started speeding back over the seven-mile bridge that connects Big Pine Key with Key Marathon. I was feeling mighty fine. The night had been well spent. Every inch of my body felt good. A pleasant numbness in my fingers and toes told me that the reunion with my old lover, Alcohol, had clearly been a success. And why not consummate the relationship As I sped across that bridge, I unzipped my pants and slowly brought my right hand down, touching myself. (laughs) Fuck yeah. I was alive. I was young. I was invincible. It must have only been a minute or so before I saw blue lights behind me. (laughs) Getting off would have to wait. I knew enough to place both hands on the wheel and pull over. As the cops approached the car, my good manners kicked in and I rolled down the window, stuck my head out, and said, how can I help you, sir? Do you know you were doing 85 in a 55 zone? He leaned over and glanced in the window, spotting an empty beer bottle on the passenger's side floor. Where did that come from, I wondered. He asked me to step out of the car, and to my surprise, I failed the field sobriety test. At this point, I became belligerent, which did not improve matters. I overheard the words bizarre behavior when he took me into the station. So the next morning, instead of plunging into the crystal clear, warm waters of the Florida Keys, I awoke on a cot in a jail cell. It took until about three in the afternoon for me to get in touch with a friend back home who was able to bail me out. Upon release, they returned to me the only items that I'd had with me the night before. My driver's license and four dollars in cash. They gave me a card with the contact info of the tow lot where my rental car was. Exhausted, hungry, and humbled, I emerged into the bright, sunny Florida afternoon and headed across the street to a gas station and called the number on the card. When I asked about the location of my towed rental car, the clerk clerk replied condescendingly, You violated the terms of the rental contract. You got arrested for dangerous operation of a vehicle that doesn't belong to you. Legally, I cannot release the car to you. I've already called Avis in Miami, and they're sending someone down to pick it up. You will be charged a $150 pickup fee plus towing and storage. I hung up the phone and burst into tears. The man in the office, probably in his late 50s, a full head of white hair and sparkling blue eyes, asked me what the problem was. When I told him, he looked at me kindly and said, I've been sober for 20 years in AA, but I've been there. It's time for you to move on, find other things to do. I simply nodded and tearfully looked at him with every ounce of attractive but desperate 28-year-old female charm that I could muster. He took a $20 bill out of his pocket and handed it to me. Here, there's a Greyhound bus back to Key Largo in about half an hour. This will be enough to get you on it. Good luck. I thanked him and headed for the bus stop. Only now do I realize that I could have easily driven off the bridge that night. That being arrested might have saved my life. At the time, I was all attitude, making flippant remarks like, you should never drink and drive, but if you do, don't do it in a rental car. At the time, I considered my experiment a success. 
I truly believe that what had happened could be explained by a simple loss of tolerance. Instead of focusing on the embarrassment of the arrest, the danger that I had put myself in, and the money it was going to cost me, I focused on those moments at the conference where I had caught the perfect buzz. I wanted to believe that this proved that I could both control and enjoy alcohol, and I would spend the next 15 years trying, sometimes succeeding, sometimes not.